Okay, great. So welcome everybody to this talk of the Israel Algorithmic Game Theory Seminar. I'm delighted to have uh, Tami Tamir here with us talking about resource fine games with low dependent costs. So welcome, Tami. Toda Rabba for the invitation and I'm happy to open the spring part of the seminar. Uh, so I talk about resource buying games with low dependent cost. It's a joint work with two Greek colleagues. Costa is currently in, in Google Research in the US and Irini is a master student in Athens University, now, now applying for a PhD in uh, the US. But it all started when she was still undergrad. Okay, so uh, it actually all started with network formation games. A network formation game, this is the basic model of cost sharing that I assume you know. Uh, so in network formation game, the nodes correspond to locations and the edges correspond to communication channel as, and every edge is associated with the cost, the cost of creating the, the edge. And we have players, the players need to transmit messages. Every player is given by a source and a target. And we have a very basic fair cost sharing rule. It says that if uh, X agent are using an edge, then they equally share the cost of the edge. Each of them pays the cost of the edge divided by X divided by the load. And for this simple, just a second, for this simple setting, everything is well understood. Uh, it's an exact potential game. The price of anarchy equals the number of players. The price of stability is the harmonic number of the players. We also know, since it's an exact potential game, then clearly a Nash equilibrium exists, but computing a Nash equilibrium is PLS complete. And then came the variants. There are many, many variants of cost sharing games, starting with playing with the strategy space. Maybe it's not given by a source and a target, but any subset of the resources, these are, these are general games. Maybe it's a matroid or a singleton game or many other variants. Maybe the costs are not uh, constant. Maybe the cost of an edge depends on the load on, on the cost. These are called congestion games. Uh, maybe the sharing is not fair. In the model I just introduced, all the players that, need, that use an edge pay the same weight. Maybe it's not the case. Maybe we have weighted players and they pay according to the weight that they generate. Maybe we have an arbitrary cost sharing that depends on the players and there are many, many more variants. And one of the variants that I will going to zoom into, consider arbitrary cost sharing. In arbitrary cost sharing, uh, we have N players and we will assume that the players are not weighted and we have a set E of M resources and assume for now that the strategy space is unlimited. So every player is also given SJ, this is the strategy space of player J, it's any subset, set of subsets of the resources. So if, for example, S2 is AC and BC, then player two needs that he needs to use either A and C or B, C and E. Unlike fair cost sharing game, a profile of such a game is defined by both PJ where PJ is the set of resources that the player selects. And this is the new thing, CJ. This is the payment vector of the player, the payment that the player declares. CJ includes for every resource E, how much player J is willing to pay for using E. So if, for example, player two selects the to use the resources A and C, then together with the choice of P2 AC, it should also declare that I select using A and C, I'm ready to pay three for A and five for using C. For example, this means that CA2 equals three and CC2 equals five. So this is the model. And given such a profile, we know what's the load on the resource. The load is the number of the players that use a resource. And we also assume that the cost activation, the activation cost of the resource depends on the load. So we have a function CE, what's the activation cost of resource E for every given load. And now we check, 
we check whether the payments of the players that use E cover its activation cost. If they do, then the resource is open. And again, know that here we have low dependent costs. Tommy, What's the cost would I ask a player? question? Sure. Well, what is, is the motivation of, for modeling the player as having a value for using an edge and not for the task for, or for the whole part? Uh, actually, it's a good question. It's a good question. Uh, there are also models in which the players declare the total payment they are willing to pay for a specific strategy. But since we want to, to, to study the, the most general case in which they do split the, the resources, because maybe they, they want to exactly know what's the benefit of replacing exactly one resource. It would give us more freedom to, to study this more general setting in which they really specify the, the specific cost for each, uh, for each resource. But do you have a story in mind for having a willingness to pay for uh, an edge and not for the task? Prob probably there are. Uh, uh, so, so I think it, it corresponds to cases in which there is, you have some rational for standing for how, how is it reasonable to pay such an amount for using this specific resource? So I don't, I don't have an application in mind. Do I you think maybe, maybe Ilan, for example, Ilan. maybe the resources are owned by uh, different uh, entities and there is no central authority that can uh, collect all the, aggregate all the information and determine how to divide the payments among the resources, for example. Thanks, this is, yes, this, this can motivate. Yeah, what, Ilan, what, what Ilan wants is to add a constraint that summation CEJ over E for fixed J is less or equal than your value, than the value of J for the whole thing. So there's some no. additional constraints. Isn't that what you what want to mind? What in land in Milra, sort of why, why modeling an agent is having the willingness to pay for for the segments and not for the task, you know? Mm -hmm. That's thinking no, of, of a story in mind. That, yeah, but since, since what the agent cares is about the sum of the payments, he doesn't care, he cares about the summation. So what I'm proposing to model that, summation exceed J over E, being mm -hmm. bounded from above by something, which is uh, which is the willingness to pay of uh, agent J. Uh, so every agent, I think, can make by itself that such a bound, and then to how he, how he divides the payments. Um, yes, but, but these are also reasonable models, right? Two agents so, have value. So just value to clarify, the these are given, or those are things, those are objects that you are looking for. The, Every player declares his payments. So, so it's, this is just the model. We will, we will study how the, which types of, uh, of uh, uh, vectors will, will lead to which uh, profile. Okay, but it's part, it's part of the, it's part of the, uh, of, uh, of the strategy of the player to, to declare the payments. They are not given, it's part of the strategy. And what are the players' no. values? Excuse me? What are the players' values? Does it, does it, is it okay? Is, yeah, this, okay. Is, these are the player values. So the cost of a player in a profile, uh, if all the resources that the profile, that the player wants to use are open, then he simply pays its uh, total declared payments. And if some resource is not open, then the cost is infinity. So this is the model. And let's see an example again, a very, a very basic example uh, of uh, resource buying games with arbitrary cost sharing. Uh, let's assume now for now that the, our four resources are the edges A, B, C, and D. We have two players. Player one want, a, want to buy a pass from S1 to T1. So player one has two strategies, B, C, or A, D, and similarly, the second player can use either A, B, or D, C. And every resource costs one, every edge costs one. And now you can see that independent of the profile that they declare, independent of the payments that they declare, 
in every profile one edge is shared, one resource is shared. And at least one of the two players has a positive payment for this shared resource. And assume, for example, that this is, these are the payments. It's always beneficial to increase your payment to make the resources open, because otherwise the cost is infinity. So this is a valid possible payment in which both of the both players have a path from their source to their target. And now notice that both of them has a positive payment on resource A. So both of them would benefit from changing their strategy. For example, the green player, player one, can change his strategy knowing that the cost of resource B is already fully covered by the red player. He would only need to pay for resource C. So this is a beneficial move. Now in turn, resource uh, player A, a play, the red player can reduce his payment knowing that C is already fully covered by the red, by the green player, the second player will deviate. So with fixed cost resources, a Nash equilibrium may not exist. And they also show in that paper that the price of stability equals the number of players. And in general, very, bad thing and very non-stable, we have a very non-stable model. So without- so you're, you're not allowed to split uh, fractional, fractional routing is not allowed, right? Right, everything is, all the strategies are pure strategies. In all, in all this paper and all this talk, I only consider pure strategies. But fractional restores existence, right? Right. Yeah, okay. So uh, with arbitrary cost sharing, the game is significantly less stable. The equilibrium inefficiency is high. And in general, strange things happen even in very simple environments. And this is what we wanted to deal with. We want to allow arbitrary cost sharing. We want stability. We want low equilibrium inefficiency. And the question is whether it can be achieved and how. So this is what I'm going to talk about. And uh, I will briefly uh, define uh, things that you already know. So a profile is a pure Nash equilibrium if no player can reduce his cost. Note that in our model, now changing a strategy may be changing the set of resources and also declaring new payments. So the strategy is given by both the set of resources and the declared payment. Um, strong equilibrium, if no set of players is able to change their strategies, if there is no coalition, I will also mention some results that has to do with the uh, coordinated deviations. And we measure the social optimum according to the total cost of the player. In some models, they consider the maximal cost of some player. We consider the total cost of the player. This is the social optimum of the game. And the question is, can we find some arbitrary cost sharing mechanism in which a Nash equilibrium, a strong equilibrium exists? And if they do, what's the equilibrium inefficiency that will be measured by the price of anarchy and the price of stability? And similarly, the strong price of anarchy and strong price of stability, they will measure the equilibrium inefficiency with respect to coordinated deviations. And I will also mention something about the convergence of best response dynamics. In best response dynamics, in each turn, some player is chosen to perform his best response, the other players, given the, the strategies of the other players. Um, some related work. So I already mentioned that there are many works on cost sharing in general. And I think that the main, the two main characterizations are whether the cost is shared fairly by the players that use the resource or arbitrarily, and whether the activation cost of a resource depends on the load or does not depend on the load. So these are, I think, the two major characterization of a cost sharing game. So we started with network formation game, this was the first example with fair cost sharing and fixed cost. And now then came the uh, uh, congestion games. Congestion games are actually cost sharing games with load dependent cost. 
and all the players experience the same cost. So it's like fair cost sharing. So for fair cost sharing, things are relatively known. Uh, I will zoom uh, in. Question, to... sorry, you said that you might not have a pure Nash at all. What's the price of energy then? It's not infinity? With arbitrary, with arbitrary cost sharing. Oh, I see, under fair, under fair there always exists uh, Nash equilibrium. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I see. Okay, so okay. Those, uh, those funny card uh, marks mean what? Unknown or it's infinity or what? That we will zoom into next slide. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, so our work belongs to this square when we have arbitrary cost sharing and low dependent cost. And for each of these models, of course, I will not go over all the results or the related work, but there are many work that consider a restricted player strategy space, maybe given by source and the target, maybe given by a, a singleton game in which every player needs to select just one resource as in scheduling games, just select one machine and many other uh, restricted strategy spaces. And there are additional models with weighted players and other cost sharing models. And now let's move to this column of arbitrary uh, 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 cost sharing. So we already saw that a Nash equilibrium might not exist. On the other hand, there are some positive results when we restrict the set of uh, 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 the set of uh, strategies if we need to build uh, to, 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 to buy edges or other very specific uh, games. With low dependent costs, they tend to be more stable. So this part of the table, when we have low dependent costs, they seem to be more stable. And these two works that are most related to, 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 to my talk, they consider more general models in which different in which different resources may have different cost activations. In the in the work that I will present in a second, all the resources have the same cost function, and this is one of the reasons why we were able to achieve positive result. So uh, the work of uh, uh, Tobias Hartz and Britta Pace they they considered resource buying game, which is exactly this model but every resource has its own, uh, uh, own uh, activation cost function. So they have mostly negative results while we have more positive results. So we already mentioned that with arbitrary cost sharing, it, first of all, this is not something that I mentioned already, but it may be really unfair and it may have, and we may have very high price of anarchy. And the intuition is that a player that must use a resource may suffer a very large cost, while others can freeload on him. Uh, here is a very simple example that will uh, uh, illustrate this problem. Uh, assume that we have n players and n resources, players one to n. The first player is very restricted. His strategy space consists of just one resource. He must use resource one. Each of the other players can either use resource one or resource J. Player J can select between one and J. So I believe you already see in your mind that while the social optimum will spread the players on the resources one to N, here the loads, uh, uh, all the resources have the same unit load. Uh, in a possible Nash equilibrium, they will all, all join player number one. And if our cost function is linear, meaning that the cost is like in congestion game, the cost, if we have load one, then the cost is one. If we have load n, then the cost is n square. Player number one will suffer, must pay in every, uh, in, in every uh, uh, profile in which the cost of player one is finite, then he would declare n square. This is his only option. He has no alternative. So we have that the price of anarchy is in. And remember that we want low equilibrium. We want stability. The question is, can it be achieved? And here we have a hint. And this is the, the main idea of, of, of our result. Let's try to limit a bit the 
arbitrary, in arbitrary cost sharing, but we will do it in a very reasonable way. And we introduced the marginal contribution constraints. The marginal contribution constraints, it's a simple and reasonable fix. It says that no player may pay more than the load on the resource square minus the load on the resource minus one square. And this term is exactly the activation cost with him minus the activation cost without him. Let's see an example. So assume that the load is four. If the load is four, then the activation cost is 16, four square. We assume that we use linear activation cost. So in every feasible solution, the payment for every player on E must be at most seven, seven, which is 16, the cost with him minus the cost without him. So this is what we call the marginal contribution constraint. We, sorry, let, let me we, are, sorry. Yes. we are in the case where C equals C of N is N squared. That's why yes. it takes square. Yes. So it's just a special case, right? Okay. So for some, for some reason, this, this slide was missing from the, yes, but yes, the, okay. the activation okay. cost is F squared. Okay, no, I... Mm -hmm. So let me first convince you that this constraint is reasonable. And it's reasonable because, and firing, because no one would like to pay more than the marginal contribution constraint. And if a player do pay more than its marginal contribution constraint, then presumably he can temporarily leave. The other players will pay Fe minus one square to keep the resource active. And then our player will return and will pay exactly the marginal cost. For example, here is a resource, the load is four. They need to pay together 16. Assume that someone is paying more than seven. The marginal contribution of every player is seven. Every player increases from, from nine to 16, the cost of the resource. So the marginal contribution of every player is exactly seven. Assume that some player is paying more than seven, then he can temporarily leave. The other players now must increase their payments in order to cover the activation cost of the resource. So they will somehow increase their cost, say in fair cost sharing, but whatever it is, now their total payments must be nine. And now our player can return and he would pay exactly the marginal contribution because he increases the cost from nine to 16. I mean, sorry if I can, if I can say something. That makes sense. I mean, when you do this per resource, Mm -hmm. uh, is problematic because he cannot say I'm not going. I'm going out because if he goes out and does not have an alternative, he may have an infinite cost, uh, right. which makes this not credible at all. You can, right. you but, can but argue he has this. Some look ahead. He has some look ahead, and he said, no, okay, but, but, I'm not ready no, to. I'm not ready to pay more than seven. What would you do? Of course, it's it, on one hand, it's just you. I, I mean, you, you can make threats, but if the cost to you is infinite, you have no other option, this threat, nobody's going to take it seriously, I'm sorry. So, so the, 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 this makes more sense when you look at changing the whole route, okay? And saying, look, I have an alternative and I can do that, so I'm not going to pay more than that. When you, when you translate this into pair edge, it's a little problematic, I would say. For the next, for the next iteration, for the next iteration, I know that's what you do now. But I'm, I'm suggesting something for the next iteration, trying to look at that condition. Uh, but uh, same as you said, from the same logic, that if uh, the player that pays more lives, then he has an uh, infinite uh, cost uh, or, or loss or whatever. So it also can be true for the other players, because if he lives and they are left without the resource. So with your logic, now they have infinite loss. So right. they must compensate. Right, so, so again, in, in, for my side, I, I think it's okay. They, they will increase their payment from two to three and then he will join back. But, but I, I, I agree that, tempo, that, that I need this look ahead. So 
we, be, we believe when we, when we wrote the paper, we believe that the marginal contribution constraints is a natural request for stability. Systems that don't support the, the marginal contribution constraint. First, of course, we like it because I will show you now a list of very nice positive results. When you apply the marginal contribution constraints, everything will become nicely and stable and low, low uh, uh, the price of stability will reduce to a constant. It's a very, very nice thing that I will show you in a second. So it works. Now the question, is it really reasonable? Uh, of course, you have your criticism and I agree with it, but we still believe that it's reasonable because if you do have this look ahead that if I will leave the others will pay this nine and then I will join, uh, we liked it. But, but maybe, uh, Tammy, maybe an alternative uh, explanation is through some kind of fairness. So instead of saying it's uh, a story why it's it's like reasonable for stability. You say it's not fair that he's paying so much, right? It's um, yes, but if you talk about fairness, then why not fair cost sharing? Uh, you're right. So fair cost sharing. You call is... it fair, but it's actually equal cost sharing. It doesn't necessarily mean fair, right? Maybe fairness. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the alternative uh, definitions for fairness. Right, and, and indeed one of the one of the open problems that I will mention at the end are how fair we can still get if we only have the marginal contribution constraints and the price of fairness, things like that. Anyway, are you, are, you assuming, are you assuming the function C is convex? Because otherwise you may get into trouble. One going out and then the yes. marginal contribution in fact going up. I only consider a, a linear, linear cost function. So C of X is a linear cost per player. So C of X is, is X squared. Linear and now cost. our results, assuming the marginal contribution constraint and assuming oh, that the cost is x squared, uh, things become very nice. A Nash equilibrium always exists, strong Nash equilibrium always exists, the strong price of stability is one. We have just a constant price of anarchy uh, for general game, for specific games like singleton game and uniform matroid games, the price of anarchy is about four. Uh, we prove several properties of coordinated deviation and some bounds on the convergence of BRD. And it's typically faster than in fair cost sharing and I will give you some intuition why it works. Uh, so, so Tammy? Yes. Uh, all, all of these results are specific for the cost uh, x squared, uh, because I um, think some, of, yes, these, uh, yes, some yes. of these results seem to generalize to any convex cost function. Right, right. Like the, con the existence, I, I will mention it. Uh, maybe at the end, I will just say, here I used it, x squared, here I did it. But, but uh, yes, most of them are general. Uh, so why is it that a strong Nash equilibrium always exists and the strong price of stability equals one? So the proof is by presenting an algorithm that sets payment given a social optimum solution such that the resulting profile is a strong Nash equilibrium. And the algorithm goes like that. Give me an optimal profile, P star, and now I will determine an arbitrary order of the players. Let's say that this is the order of the players and these are the strategies in P star. I will assign them one by one and every player will pay exactly the marginal cost that it creates. So I will add player one. He's the first player to use the three resources. That, so he would pay one, one, one for each of them. Player two is added. He's the second player so he increases the cost, the, the, the activation cost from one to four. So he would pay the marginal cost, which is three. And now come player three that would pay five, five and five and player four would pay seven and three. And now we can sum up. These are the total cost of the players. Of course, the order is crucial. If I change the order, I will get the same, the same optimal profile with the same total cost, but with totally different uh, players' payments. Now, player one is the last one, so he would pay seven, three, and five. So first notice that indeed the activation costs are covered. And this is simply because whenever we add a player, we will cover the cost of the resources that uh, it joins. 
the, the also it's easy to see that the marginal contribution constraint is kept because every player pays exists exactly the marginal cost at the time that he joins. Maybe the final cost would be higher, but when I join, I would pay the current uh, marginal uh, cost. More challenging part was to show that this is indeed a, a strong equilibrium, that any deviation from P star with the above payment scheme cannot reduce the total cost of the deviating coalition, or if it's just one player, then it's a Nash equilibrium. Um, and just know that it's it's not a real algorithm, it's just an existence proof because step one of finding the social optimum, this is a, a hard problem. So it's just an existence proof. And this is valid for any cost function of the form X to the D, actually every convex uh, uh, function. Questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yes. So it seems, uh, it seems that what you are doing, you are saying here is an upper bound that I put on the payment of every agent for every resource, and mm -hmm. I get some strong existence result. Another way like to turn this question around is to ask what's the minimum upper bound to put on the payment of an agent that guarantees this existence. Uh, yeah. And maybe, so for example, if for example, you find that this is the optimal upper bound mm -hmm. to put, that would even strengthen your result. Um, yes, nice, nice direction. I, maybe it's required for a constant price of anarchy, maybe not for the existence, because I, I will show you in a second that the price of anarchy becomes a constant while I showed you that without the constraint, it's order n. Maybe this is the right question to ask. When do we move from price of anarchy uh, that depends on n to a constant one? But, but yes, nice question. I uh, and I, I, would add, I would add to that going in the opposite direction, which mm -hmm. means making the constraint as I wanted uh, global, uh, which means that the total that he pays on all the resources doesn't exceed his marginal contribution. That makes more equilibria exist, which means it increases the price of anarchy. And the uh, question is by how much? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, of course, we have existence because yeah, we have existence right here. Questions. So that's, those are two opposite uh, directions to go. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. <laughs> OK. So uh, some simple and nice properties of this mechanism. So first, in every Nash equilibrium, the cost of every resource is exactly covered. If it's not covered, then some player experience infinite cost and it would benefit from increasing his payment. If we have an overpaid resource, then some player can reduce his payment. So in every Nash equilibrium, we have exactly tight uh, payments. Um, the other observation is that if a player deviates, let's say from PJ to PJ prime, it would pay uh, exactly, it wouldn't change its payment for the uh, resources that he's still using. And for every new resource that uh, he joins, he would pay exactly the marginal contribution. If a player leaves the resource, if a player leaves the resource, then the cost of the resource is surely covered by the players that remain on it. This is an, an important observation. Uh, again, let's see what's the meaning. So we know that the activation cost is 16. We know that everyone is paying at most seven. This is the marginal contribution of every player. So for every player, the other three players are paying at least nine meaning that if some player leaves, then we don't hurt the stability of the other players. The other players surely cover the activate, their activation cost. This is another nice property of the marginal contribution constraint. When you leave the resource, the other players are happy. They don't suffer. Maybe they, they are still stable. And similarly, if you join a resource, if you join a resource, since you pay by yourself the, your new contribution, the marginal contribution, then the players that are already on the resource, they are not affected. 
So these two properties intuitively, I hope that you think that they, they are good for fast BRD convergence because once I move, I know that I wouldn't need to increase my payment. And this is not the true with fair cost sharing. When other people, when other people join me or leave my resource, I may need to increase or decrease my cost. So this is another nice property uh, of the model. Now let's move to the price of anarchy, and I will show you that it's a constant 17 over 3, and we were using the smoothness technique introduced by Tim Rafgarden. Uh, so once and for all, let's see what's the smoothness technique. Um, so it's starting with just a magical uh, mathematical uh, uh, statement. Suppose lambda and mu, they are positive real numbers and such that this is fulfilled for all the integers y and x. Then the price of anarchy is at most lambda over one minus mu. Um, proving this lemma, this is the real thing I will show you in a second. If this is proved, then we just need to find the numbers that fulfill this, that satisfy this lemma. And the se our second lemma shows that the lemma is fulfilled by lambda equals 3.4 and mu equals 0 0.4. And this is just pure math. But if we combine lemma one and lemma two, and we have this lambda over one minus, one minus uh, mu, then we get 17 over three. So the big question is why is it true? How can we connect the price of anarchy with the fact that this statement is true? And it works like that. So uh, for a player, uh, when we, when we measure, when we analyze the price of anarchy, we need to compare the payment of the player in a Nash equilibrium with the payment of the player, the total payment. Remember that our social cost is defined by the total payment, the total payment of the players in a Nash equilibrium and the total the cost, the total cost in an, of an optimal solution. So the total cost of the Nash equilibrium we sum over the players and the resources the payments. And we already mentioned that if a player deviates, then it would pay no change on the resources that he keeps using and the marginal change in the cost of the resources that it uh, joins. This is the definition of our model. And we know that we have a Nash equilibrium. We know that P is a Nash equilibrium, meaning that it's not beneficial for the players to uh, deviate. So let's sum up this not benefit for all the players. By definition, the cost of P is F square for all the resources, F e of P for all the resources in E. Uh, and we know that all the activation in every Nash equilibrium, I just mentioned that in every Nash equilibrium, the payments exactly cover the activation cost, so we can change to sum over the players. And we've just mentioned that we have a Nash and moving is not beneficial. It meaning that the current cost, the current pay payment of player J is at most what he would pay if he would switch. If he would switch, he would pay the same for the resources that he keep using and the marginal, uh, uh, and the, the marginal cost for the new resources. By the marginal contribution constraint, we can bound these payments also by FEP plus one square minus FEP. So instead of summing in a different sum, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the difference and the, and the, and the, uh, and the joint uh, resources, we can sum all the resources in P star together. And now this is just pure mass. This is the first part. So we know that cost of P is at most. Now, if we sum over the load in the, uh, in the uh, 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 optimal solution, this is what we have. Moving, proceeding, starting from this point. And now we change the summation. Instead of summing the resources over the 
players, we sum the players that use the resource, and we know that the number of players in this sum is exactly the load on the resource in P star, because we sum over all the J such that E is in P star, so we can multiply by the load. And now we use the assumption of dilemma. We have exactly the structure that we need, 2x plus 1, y is at most lambda y squared plus mu x squared. So x is actually FEP, y is FEP star. We use the assumption of dilemma and we conclude that cost of P, this is cost of P, is at most lambda the cost of opt plus mu cost of P. So the price of anarchy is given. Any questions about this? The nice thing is that it is tight. And this is the example showing that it's tight. So on one hand, it's like a magic. How did we come to that number? But the lower bound will give you some intuition. So this is a relatively simple game. We have sev exactly seven players and 21 resources. They are arranged in triples. So we have A0, B0, C0, up to A6, B6, C6. These are the resources. And every player has exactly two strategies, either AJ, BJ, CJ, the three resources with his index, player J, these are the three resources of player J, or seven resources. Which seven resources? This is, this is the second strategy of the player the three next A, the two next Bs, and the two next Cs. Okay, and all the calculation is modulo seven. These are the two possible strategies of player J. What's the social optimum and also the best Nash equilibrium? Every player uses his uh, first strategy, selects his first strategy. He's the only player on these strategies, so the payments must be one for each resource. So every player select AJ, BJ, CJ, player zero select A0, B0, C0, and so on. Everyone is paying one for every resource that he uses. The, uh, the cost for every player is three, so the total cost is 21. This is the so social optimum. On the other hand, if they select their second strategy, the one with the seven resources and declare payments such that we have fair cost sharing. This is how the profile looks like. And let's consider, for example, player zero. So he's using the three A's, the, the, the A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, C1, C2. He has three resources with load three. And since we are using fair cost sharing, he would pay three for each of these three resources. He would pay two for the four resources B and C. Altogether, he would pay 70. Is it a Nash equilibrium? Yes, it's a Nash equilibrium. Why is it a Nash equilibrium? Consider again our player zero. By deviating to his other strategy, he would join A0, B0, and C0. He would increase the load from three to four, so he would pay seven for A0 because he need to pay the marginal contribution. The new, the new, he needs to cover the, the change in the cost. These are our rules. And he would pay five for each of B2 and C, uh, for each of uh, B0 and C0, meaning that altogether he would pay exactly 17, which is exactly the cost that he was paying here. So we conclude that the the social optimum is this strategy. Everyone is paying exactly three. This is a possible Nash equilibrium. Everyone is paying 17. So the price of anarchy is 17 over three, exactly like the uh, uh, lower bound. What about coordinated deviations? So we also saw, uh, saw that the strong price of anarchy is 17 over three. The upper bound 
Sorry. By the way, tell me, uh, you are, sorry, you are lambda and so on, it's, it's something like two plus square root two, uh, which you rounded up to 3.4 or something? No, or no rounding, it's exactly, so. It's exactly 3.4? Exactly, yes. From, so, from so, optimizing so you the lambda and mu? These numbers, these numbers, they simply work. Actually, I mean, we started precise, with lower okay. bound. I see, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So you you just you just minimize lambda over one minus mu over all lambda and mu satisfying that thing, and you get exactly this three point four and zero point four, right? Right. That's right. interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, and I would just mention that the same, the same, the, the upper bound clearly follows because for every class of game the price of anarchy is uh, is not lower than the strong price of anarchy. The nice thing is that also the lower bound is valid. Uh, how do we show the lower bound? We take the example for uh, 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 for the price of anarchy lower bound, and we concatenated many, many, many copies. The problem with the price of anarchy is that all the players can simultaneously perform a coalition. If they move together, then they will switch. For we, we said that we have two, uh, two profiles. If all the players together form a coalition and move from P to P star, they will all benefit. So this is not a strong uh, Nash equilibrium. So it's not that automatically the lower bound follows. In order to make it follow, we need to take many, many copies and change only the extreme copies to have different strategy space. So they would not join a coalition that consists of all the players. These extreme copies, they contribute to that epsilon, uh, but the same story. So, the same lower bound, and this is a technique that, is, that we saw also in other games. If we have a, a, a lower bound for the price of anarchy and we want to make it a lower bound for the strong price of anarchy, we can take many copies and just somehow make sure that the set of all players together will not form a, a coalition by just playing with the extreme copies. So it's doable also here. Um, I will skip the result for matroid resource allocation, uh, so resource bind games, when we have limited strategy space. I will also mention that here we used some reduction that has to do with online load balancing. And this is a nice connection between the problems. In, in online load balancing, uh, we have jobs and machines, jobs are coming, and when a job arrives, you need to assign him to a machine and every job has a limited set of machines. So it's like a singleton game. So these guys, they have a very nice analysis of online load balancing. This is the competitive ratio in online, you talk about competitive ratio, this is the competitive ratio of the algorithm. And it seemed, it, it turned out that the problems are really related because if you assign a new job greedily on a machine, on a least loaded machine, it's like selecting a resource with the minimal marginal cost. And their goal is to minimize the L2 norm of the loads, which is actually our social cost. So there is a nice relation between the problems. Of course, they are not the same because we have arbitrary cost sharing. So, so we had our challenges, but it turned out that we can manipulate their, their analysis and get the same, their competitive ratio is like our price of anarchy. And also it's almost tight. If here we have some gap, while the number itself is four point something, our uh, lower bound is just four. But I will skip this example because I want to talk more about coordinated deviations because there were some surprises here. Okay. Uh, Tammy, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Do you know what happens to your price of anarchy and price of stability for the special case of um, of like where agents need to form paths in a graph? Um, no, we don't have anything which is tighter than the general case. 
So it may be the case, for example, that for a network uh, formation game, uh, the price of anarchy is even smaller. Right. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe one of the papers of Martin Hofer considered uh, these specific uh, strategy classes, but I, I, I don't remember now. Okay, so now let's see what happens with when we allow coordinated deviation, because again, we are going to see some strange uh, things here. Consider even the very simple case of symmetric singleton game. In symmetric singleton game, it means that every player needs one resource and all the resources are available, are open for all the player. In all other uh, settings, this is the very simple, only, only perfectly balanced assignment is, is, is a solution. But here we have a Nash equilibrium, which is not balanced. Four players are using resource A, two players are using resource B, each of them is paying four. Moving to resource B will lead to payment five. So no one wants to move to uh, resource B. So it's a Nash equilibrium. But it's not a strong equilibrium because these three guys can move together. The pink guy will tell him, replace with our location. You can reduce your cost from two to one and we will also benefit so while it's a Nash equilibrium, it's not a strong equilibrium. Uh, so the price of anarchy, well, it's a Nash equilibrium. So the price of anarchy is uh, 10 over nine, while the strong price of anarchy is one. Uh, now, what do you think? Is it true that the strong price of anarchy is one in every symmetric singleton game? In symmetric singleton game, everyone can go. Could it be that it's not balanced? This is like asking, asking whether the strong price of anarchy is one. It's like asking, could it be that it's not balanced? What's your guess? But, um, so no, and here is a simple example. Uh, if we only have four players and two machines, uh, this is a Nash equilibrium and also a strong equilibrium. Let's see why. So it's easy to see that it's a Nash equilibrium. Moving from A to B, you must increase the, you must pay the marginal cost from one to four, you must pay three. So no one wants to move by himself. If you don't want to move by yourself, can you convince the player that currently pay one to replace with you like we had here. Again, no, because he's ready to pay at most one. He's ready to pay for switching. He would like to pay less than one. And if he pays less than one, then he wouldn't pay the marginal, the, 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 uh, the gap from four. So the strong price of anarchy is more than one, even in symmetric singleton game. On the other hand, we had some positive results like showing that in every singleton game, not just symmetric, every Nash equilibrium is stable against coordinated deviations of two players. We need at least three players in order to form a coalition. On the other hand, if we just slightly relax the meaning of singleton, then we can have coalitions of size two. And here is an example even on a symmetric game. So we have three resources and eight players. The first player must you need any two resources. Each of the other seven players need just one single resource. This is a possible Nash equilibrium, even though it's really not balanced. It's a Nash equilibrium. The first player that needs two resources, he uses A and B and he's paying one and seven. No one wants to move to A because currently they are paying three. So by switching to A, they will still pay three. So this is a Nash equilibrium, um, but it's not a strong equilibrium because our red player can convince any of these six to join him and form a coalition. 
you can tell them, listen, let me use resource C and you move to resource A. You will only pay two on resource A. I'm ready to increase my payment on resource A from one to two, uh, but just let me use resource C. So you see that they have together a beneficial deviation that involves changing the payment of layer one in, on resource A. So again, strange things happen when we allow uh, uh, even uh, small coalitions because they can play with their payments on, on each of the resources. So this is a Nash equilibrium, but it's not a strong equilibrium. So when we, uh, in this game, the strong price of anarchy is one, while this price of anarchy is more than one. Summing up, almost summing up. So the main message is that we have a cost sharing scheme. It's comparable to fair cost sharing. And when I say comparable, it's comparable because we have a guaranteed strong equilibrium. We have, I didn't talk about it too much, but we, we have fast convergence. I just give you the intuition why the convergence is fast because things are more stable because of this uh, marginal contribution constraint. Uh, we have better best case scenario, the, price, the, the strong price of uh, uh, anarchy is one, unlike the harmonic number or, or other values, and only a slightly worst, worst case scenario. We have a constant price of anarchy, it's not the two and a half that we have in regular congestion game, it's 17 over three, but it's still a constant. And we have many open, open problems, actually you added to the list some nice uh, problem. So technically we have a gap for the uniform Atroid games. We still don't have a, a complete understanding of uh, the power of coalitions. Uh, and this is something I'm currently working with a student of mine about uh, fair, ad, additional fairness property. So I want arbitrary cost sharing, but I also want fairness we mentioned the, 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 the marginal contribution constraint. Maybe there's another way to measure the fairness uh, and also extend technically to other cost function when we have different cost function per resources or weighted player, all the general uh, uh, generalizations. Questions? First read because it's nice. <laughs> Thank you, Tanya.